Nigeria. It's 180 million Africans. One African in four is a Nigerian. From northern Nigeria along the Sahara Desert to the southern coastal area along the Atlantic, 300 ethnic groups speaking some 500 languages live in this country dotted with incredibly dynamic cities. Hello, I'm Georges Collinet. Nigeria is on the move. I'm sure that you've noticed the success of Nigerian singers and songwriters who won several Grammy Awards lately. You might also have watched a Nollywood movie. The Nigerian film industry has become the second largest movie producers in the world ahead of Hollywood. How did they do it? Well, let's watch. In this first episode of Sounds of Nollywood, we will explore the history of the nation of Nigeria, and we will try to see the source of the people's creativity and what artistic expression was like at the beginning, specifically theater, films, and music. Nigeria was ruled and governed by British Empire from the mid-19th century until 1960, when the country achieved independence. Professor David Killingray, in his paper titled The Maintenance of Law and Order in the British Colonies, published in African Affairs by the Oxford University Press, states, effective colonial government rested on two basic pillars. Firstly, the maintenance of law and order to uphold the authority of the administration. Secondly, the collection of adequate revenue with which to finance the running of the colony. Maintaining law and order also meant anyone could be prosecuted for speech deemed unflattering to the administration. We stumbled upon an amazing thesis by a Slovenian journalist and film scholar formerly of the Faculty of Humanities at ISH University, Dr. Melita Zeich. She will explain what films were like under colonial rule. Film was a very strong colonial weapon. It was different in France, in French colonies and in British colonies, but they were both very careful not to let... Um, uh, Africans uh, control the, this magic of, of cinema. And it was, um, even till now, probably I think it remained very difficult for uh, Africans to, um, to, to, to represent themselves the way uh, they, they understand themselves and the world uh, they live in. Let's say in Nigeria, uh, people were not allowed to make 
films by themselves. But even if they were allowed after the independence, uh, it was very difficult to achieve. One thing that I find uh, very interesting is the story, the, almost an anecdote about the, the senders of the river film uh, that uh, is taking place in Nigeria. But it is very typical for this, um, for the situation when you, um, um, they did not really made it in, in Nigeria. No? Um, and uh, I remember noticing that uh, sometimes even Alfred Hitchcock is mentioned as the director of Sanders uh, of the River. You know, Zoltan Korda is the, the director. And sometimes you see also Alfred Hitchcock. And why was that? Uh, Hitchcock says, I had a contract in one of his uh, memoirs. Hitchcock says, I had a contract with uh, Korda, but only for one year. And unfortunately, we didn't manage to do anything. But I remember that we were talking about making Wings over Africa. But we didn't do this film. Uh, but we did. Uh, I, I learned later that there was a Sanders of the River film made on the same ground. And they did this film, Sanders of the River, that was really, Hitchcock doesn't want to have anything with it, to do with it. And even Paul Robson, you know much more about him than I do, but I know that he felt very embarrassed at the end when he saw, uh, when he saw this film. Um, um, and uh, of course, uh, everything, all the, most of the creative work was done in London. You know, they went to Nigeria, they did these uh, spectacular shots, that also increased production value of the film. So it was one of the most um, expensive and most, um, let's say, um, well-known films of the time in Britain. It was also nominated for award at the Venice Film Festival at that time already. Um, but in, in, in terms of, you know, uh, presenting the Nigerians or the, the the British, the colonial power, it, it was very, it was very, you know, racist to, 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 you know, to just tell it in one word. How were the people dealing with all this? How strong was the desire for an independent state? Enter Herbert Macaulay. Born in 1884, Macaulay is considered by many as one of the fathers of Nigerian nationalism. He was a politician, surveyor, engineer, architect, journalist, and musician, and reportedly the first Nigerian to bring independent cinema to Lagos, to Glover Hall. Where is Herbert? What are we going to do about it? Well, there's one way to do it. We can try and discredit him. Enough of your tyrannical and despotic rule. Yeah. Enough of your hand in our pocket. Yeah. We're starting to lose. That, that is the only path that will lead us to the Privy Council in London where we stand the chance of winning. So for, for a long time, um, especially in my country, people have been complaining about the fact that their history has been modeled up, been written by other people. You know, and we seem to know more about the culture, the history and culture of other people than we know about us. So the modern, the modern um, young Africans uh, are more informed about things happening in other parts of the world than things happening in their own country, in their own culture, in their own history. And so I felt it was a duty for me to, you know, make this film. So I was part of the writing team that wrote um, a documentary about the 100 years um, uh, of Nigeria history of Nigeria and so while researching for that project which was a documentary I discovered that there's so many little historical things that were not known by a lot of the younger people for instance a lot of people thought Habib Macaulay was Caucasian <laughs> because the images you see of Habib Macaulay 
his, uh, you know, statues and all that. He had his mustache. They were to those Caucasian. And I remember the first time that they would drop the trailer, and the lots of people admitted they thought this guy was was white. Uh, and then, so that for me was a little victory in just documenting that. For me, it was it was more of a personal contribution to the history of my country, to documenting the history of my country, and having that material that in the future, if anybody wants to do research on, um, you know, our founding fathers, they'll have some research material because I mean we don't have a lot of research material. A lot of research material are in the UK, in the hands of the British. And sometimes getting authentic uh, material isn't that easy. When we were researching for the film, it was it was very difficult to get uh, the material. So we usually have to glean from all sorts of corners, all books that we could find, and piece together the early life of uh, Herbert Macaulay. And so we made the film. So for me, it was it was more important to document this story than for anything else. You know, realize what it was that we're going through this evil colonialism that we had to deal with and the suppression of the, the black man and it's very similar to this era which is, is amazing because history sort of repeats itself because we're almost back to that era where economically you know we're still you know living in an era where economically we're still sort of suppressed and still trying to fight for some bit of liberation economically before it was it was more of a political liberation now it's more of an economic liberation so very similar to the zedges of that uh, period so um, that's the sense I, I got and that's why when you watch the film and literally you can see parallels between that era and this era that we are existing in and it could be very inspiring for you know people that want to seek a, a different uh, path to emancipation everything has a beginning of war Life. But the most important beginning is the birth of a nation. As Imo says, the most important beginning is the birth of a nation. How inspiring. Thank you, Imo, for your fabulous work. Well, these were the earliest hints of defiance and individuality in Nigeria, a theme that is recurring again and again. So, what was the art scene like? at the birth of the nation, at Kizer. I wrote the uh, um, biography of Bobby Benson, and uh, Bobby Benson and Ugunde were competitors in the theatrical space. They could be, both of them could be described as two of the early, not earliest, but two of the earliest uh, 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 theatre legends. Now, let's not forget that they were not alone, there were others, the woman was at the uh, at the forefront of theater at the same time as this guy but you know she was a bit of a, a a comical figure not because she deserved to be felt but just like you see you know as uh, you know when people when the oppressors cannot uh, cannot suppress you they, they make light of you you know uh, they make light of you and they they make you a caricature because they're afraid of you. and that's exactly what happened her name was uh, uh Oluwali. And um, she was, she was, you know, uh, 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 staging one person shows at the same time as uh, Ogunde and uh, and uh, and, Mako and uh, what's his name and uh, Bobby Benson, you know. So you know, so uh, and let's not forget also that even before before Ogunde, there were people. There was plays being staged in the early 20th century, in the late 19th century at Glover Hall and, uh, and the Tom Jones Hall, Hall. In fact, all of them were in Lagos. Well, at least they were based in Lagos, although they, they carried their, their shows around the country, uh, or at least around the West, uh, primarily of the country. Yes, they were in Nigeria. Uh, they came back with two grand, 2,000 pounds worth of equipment in 1946. If he came back in 2000, because he was a policeman, I don't want to ask how he made his money, bro. <laughs> but, <laughs> but look, all I'll tell you is this, in 1946, 700 pounds will buy you a house. You know, so if this man came back with 2,000 pounds, well, he must have had, as they say, he must be some of a rich man, as the video will call himself. So let's just leave it at that, you know what I mean? But he came back with two grand worth of equipment. I'm absolutely, just, you know, as they say, money stop nonsense. He absolutely blitzed the scene. Hubert Ogunde was a prominent actor, playwright, theater manager, and musician who founded the first contemporary professional theatrical company in Nigeria. With a full set, you know, like 
uh, two auto and I think two auto and one tenner. Come on, man, those things weren't cheap. Even in 1946, they weren't even even seconds, even second hand, they weren't cheap. You know, so that's the difference. And the difference also is that he also taught them to play. They couldn't have been great performers, you know, um, uh, because sax players in Nigeria were, that, were few and far between. The biggest sax player in Nigeria in the, 19, the mid 1940s was Ezekiel Apata. Ezekiel Apata, you know, had had played with the Mills, you know, what they led the Mills Orchestra, you know, um, he had played in he had played in New York. Quite a few, you know, he was part of the, he was part of the jazz scene, you know. Um, I don't think he played with Goodman, with Benny Goodman, but I know that he played with contemporaries of Goodman at the time. There was a swing jazz scene of the uh, of the of the uh, mid-war years. You know, he was definitely ensconced, you know, at the time that bebop was emerging. Great sax player, but there were very few like him. And yeah. he trained a few. He trained the, the Mills Orchestra, was a leading uh, jazz and high life orchestra in Nigeria at the time. What was the effect of the growing nationalism on the arts in general and music in particular? Now, as for the arts and the influence of the nationalist movement, um, that's a very interesting question. It's a very complex question. It's not, it doesn't give out a simple answer, but I will attempt to follow through chronologically. Hmm? The 1940s was definitely at a time when the energy had picked up. You know, there was now, a, you know, I alluded to the fact that there was a strong elite uh, demographic that had been built up. Nigerians who had gone to university and come back in the professions, in law, in medicine, in other areas. Nandi Azikiwe was one of the most important characters in the development of nationalist uh, stylistics. I am something of an expert in the evolution of the editorial style of Nigerian press from the late 1800s till the early 1950s is that, yes, there was peripheral reference to art, the arts, you know, um, for sure, you know, the Lagos Weekly Record would report on concerts. The Handel, Handel concert was reported on the Lagos Weekly Record. The Nigerian Pioneer would also record, uh, report on concerts. You know, but then the those papers always stopped short of outright an outright call for nationalism. By the 1940s, especially from the mid 1940s, after the general strike of 1945, the tone changed significantly. There was a lot more boldness because this was the very first time that the British colonial infrastructure had been challenged in such a wholesale manner by organized labor. And one of their biggest champions were the press, especially the West African pilot. West African pilots embody, you know, the kind of things that we wanted that Africans wanted to say, but they could not say because most of them work for the civil service. And you know, if you said certain things against the colonial government, working in, in, it's, actually, it's actually an offense, the offense of sedition. So Zik's papers could be very outspoken and speak against the government and it was infectious. He celebrated musicians, he celebrated art performers. His uh, uh, impetuousness, you know, if there's such a word, you know, was infectious. You know, it was one of the biggest, it was the biggest selling, say, the selling newspaper after possibly the, 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 the Daily Times, which was very elitist. In its, the Daily Times was always what fella uh, was always in that stage, you know, not necessarily now. It was always what fella would describe as government chicken boy. What a fascinating era. Government chicken boy, Ed said, quoting Fela, describing the Nigerians who were too afraid to speak against the British. Fela <laughs> was a feisty one. That's, of course, Fela Kuti, the founder of Afrobeat music. And speaking of Fela, coming up, we're going to meet a graphic artist, a flutist and a saxophonist, each with stories of their encounters with Fela Kuti. Here is Jimmy Solanke, one of the original theater performers who trained in institutions of higher learning and came after the Herbert Ogunde generation. At what age I became a theater person around 1960. Before then I was a known singer. Even before I left school, I was already composing songs which uh, Roy Chicago already recorded and Oromare Aradubo Onilego Goro 
I wrote it already. Don't kaki no be led. I wrote all such songs for Roy Chicago and the Abalabi dance band when I was much, much younger. And I left Lagos and moved into Ibato. And I was jamming with different bands. And that was when I ran into uh, Brother Tunji Uyelano, who introduced me to Mbari Club at Ogunkwa Oyo in Ibado, where Shoyenka, Okibo, Yemili Jadu, Ralph Okpara, the great newscaster, blah, blah. Uh, they were all there. And then when I was introduced, I saw uh, drama is a different thing from singing. You have to, you know, you know, weave, weave in with so many other people to create one message. But in uh, 1963, the Institute of African Studies, University of Ibado, under the directorship of um, uh, Crowder, Michael Crowder, and Ulibaya and all of them, Peggy Hapa, who were all members of Mbari Club, came up with a program, School of Drama. And School of Drama, <laughs> We were all advised, if we have interest in drama, to be part of the people who will be going for the audition and the examination and the test and all that. I remember we all went, Brother Tunji Elano, myself, Yomi Obileye, Jimmy Johnson, Yewande uh, Akibo, Betty Okoti, uh, and some other people that I cannot quickly remember right now. We all went and we were admitted into the first school of drama in Africa, 1963. And so when the nitty gritty, the total, you know, groundlings of theater started you know, <laughs> uh, converging on me and taking me totally. I started saying, ah, this is different. Uh -uh. You have to know where to stand before somebody walks out. You have to know when to walk out. You have to know when to even move before you say, ha. Ah. I said, oh, this is wonderful. That's how... I got submerged, hook, line, and sinker into drama. In the 60s and 70s, music and theater were rapidly growing. Very soon, both collided with the arrival of Fela Kuti. We visit three wonderful artists. They all had amazing stories of how they met Fela Kuti, starting with graphic artist Lemi Garyoku. Mine, mine is a small corner piece in this whole story uh, because I wasn't too involved with the movie industry directly. Uh, but um, my antecedent started from a movie poster. Um, or because I self-taught, I'm autodidactic. So I used to practice with different forms of imagery. Um, at a point, uh, that was in 1974, I started doing portraits for people in my neighborhood. And uh, Bruce Lee's film, uh, film, Enter the Dragon, was released, uh, I think, late 73, early 74. So it was quite huge. And those days, we were into the fashion of watching, you know, Chinese films. These karate films were totally full-blown fashion those days. So when the Bruce Lee film came out, you know, that's like Chinese now produced in Hollywood. And you know, when Hollywood touch anything, it becomes a dynamite. So it was that powerful 
that a neighbor of mine, rather than commission me to do his own portrait or portrait of his relative or something, he commissioned me to do the poster of Bruce Lee's film. And it was interesting because as a portraitist, uh, the film had three main actors, Bruce Lee, John Saxon and Jim Kelly. So it was like triple portraiture <laughs> for me. And I did, I, I put in the graphics. It was lovely. It, it was very impressive enough that the guy uh, ran a drink place. Um, he got it framed and hung it in the drink place, you know, to attract his customers. You know, it's like these days, imagine if, if an artist is asked to paint like these footballers, you know, for, for like a viewing center. Huh? So that was the way. So there was this journalist called Batunde Harrison. He was working for Sunday Punch, the present day Punch newspaper. It used to be called Sunday Punch because it was weekly Sunday. So Babatunde Harrison went to that place to drink and he saw the Bruce Lee movie poster that I made. And he was really impressed. And Babatunde was very close friends with Fela Kuti. So he, he took that message to Fela Kuti. Um, how I, I, I got to know was he requested that he wanted to see the artist. And they said, it's a small boy next door. And he said, I want to see him. So when he, when he came to see me, he said he wanted to see my other works. Tell Fela about you, but I will give you a test. You are going to do a portrait of Fela also. And if it's good enough, I take you to Fela. So that, that was my beginnings. And that was how I got to meet Fela. You know, the, the um, Babatide has I haven't told him about the Bruce Lee poster. And also, yeah. evidently, physically, the portrait of Fela that I made. So that was the beginning. And Fela just hit it off. He actually offered me money, which I, I, I rejected. I said I gave him from the bottom of my heart. And he wrote out a gate pass for me. My grandfather was a professor in the music academy, a cellist, and he was a composer. His name was Iseli. My father was a Swiss ambassador to Nigeria. My mother was a Shakiri princess from the Niger Delta. So I have this classical and African in me. When I was born, I loved music tremendously. I left at the age of three. At the age of five, my uncle in Switzerland who was a very wealthy industrialist, took me and my two sisters to um, the opera house in Zurich. And I sat spellbound listening to the film. And I felt like, this is what I hear in my dreams. My stepfather, who married my mother after my Swiss father was assassinated, he said, you cannot just be a musician. To him, musician was kind of those Kudu, 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 guys. So I had to pick up a job in UTC, Union Trading Company, as a manager. Since I had a Swiss passport, I had a good education, I of course got the top job, but I didn't like it. So I started my first band, T-Mac, an Afro collection with fantastic musicians. We got a small place on Broad Street, lovely air conditioned place called Bata Koto. And our Friday night jam night became so popular that Fela came every Friday with his saxophone. All the top musicians would come on Friday to jam with my band. I left Nigeria in 72, back to Switzerland, formed Team Mac United, which is a very high band. And the um, MD of Polydor heard me. So he gave me a contract to do my first album in Hamburg. I called the album United. And we were so well organized that he said, oh, we, we have about 10 days studio time left. Let's do some KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. So we did some elevator music. I wrote the music, he wrote the so-called lyrics, which were only sing-alongs. 
Let me tell you the name of the songs. Save me, save me, I'm falling in love. Was one. The other one was Get up and boogie, get up and boogie. And the weirdest one was called Fly, Robin, fly, fly, Robin, fly, fly, Robin, fly. So I had no money for horn section, so we used a violin student. We had three girls chanting. And I was then, I moved to the band to Holland, where I got the great news. We were number one in the American Hip Parade. We were number one in 11 other countries, and we made a ton of money. But it was not actually a band. It was a session band. It was Team Mac United. But we toured the world under the name Silver Convention to milk it. Well, after two years, I found out that the producer, Mr. Kunze, was eating a lot of the money and I backed out. I came back to Nigeria. So that was my experience with the big show business. Frustrating, interesting, repetitious, yeah. the same shows, matinee, evening shows. It was not the life I liked. My manager, Jim Bishop, you may know Jim Bishop of Philly Sound, Jim Bishop. He was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was yeah. the manager of Temptation, Led Betty LaBelle, the Jacksons, Teddy Pendergrass. He managed Silver Convention and me. He said, Tima, get out of this, you bush, come to America. So he got me a two years contract with C.D. Croft Enterprise. And I was writing, bang, 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 that Muppet show strings was terrible. And then I got a contract to work for Universal. So I did a couple of film tracks, but the problem was because I have a Swiss and a Nigerian passport, the musician union did not allow me to have the major films. They asked me to become an American citizen. I don't want well to be an American. I'm happy to be a Nigerian. They thought I'm crazy. <laughs> My name is Kola Ogukoya, the Beju Master. So, but thank God, today we're good. And my family, my dad is from uh, Ogu State, my mom is from Ogu State. That's where we're from. That's how we roll. Getting into music is a long journey. But I thank God today, you see, I started from church, and uh, it's called Aladura Church. That's where we started from. I was playing the clefs and the shaker and um, I love music and uh, finally I was able to join the choir and from there I was able to learn one or two instruments and learning the instrument really put me on highway when I say highway I mean putting me into the line of music and uh, from church I was able to play with uh, the whole musicians like Victor Laya like uh, Eddie Okota like uh, you know a lot of big Oh, Nigeria artist and from every corner. Hey, me and Fela Nikula Pokuti, Lenio, respect. May so rest in peace. Fela for life. Afro beat for life, like we always say. Look, it's been a long time. People call me Bedu Master. They don't know the meaning of Bedu Master. Fela was the one that gave me Bedu Master. And that was in the days of Lucky Sun Splash. Back in the days. And that was the first time Fela saw me play live. I was still very young, you know, and all that. We were built to play the same show. And uh, Fela is going to play last show. And Fela was backstage. And I put my band on stage and we were playing. Everybody started coming from everywhere. You know, like it's on Slash, how it used to be. Seven Up and all that good stuff. So Fela was like, are we playing now? What's going on over there? You know, Fela is the first one that will get to show before every other artist. Kola Ogunkoya, Raski Mono, may so rest in peace. Majek Fashek, and you know, all that good stuff back then. So Fela was hearing us play and he was so surprised. He was like, who is that guy? And they said, no, no, it's not your band. Though. It's one guy, one young guy like that. And he said, okay. He's speaking uh, Yoruba language, the Abelkuta language. He told the guy, Aniboro, when that guy finished, tell him, may come back here, may come see me for stage. So, 
while I was playing, they come on stage and told me that. And I was so scared. I was like, eh? Pelasi man come. Ah, then go beat me today. <laughs> I mean, no kidding. I was like that. But surprisingly, it was like, come, come, come. Have you been to Shrine? I said, no. Have you been in my band? I said, ah, Baba, I no, no. Then he said, how you play the Afrobeat like that? I said, I was listening to your records and all that, so I was doing Riazza on it and all that. And the good thing about it is that we were playing our own music, Afrobeat, created by us, you know, composed and everything arranged. And that was why he was so happy that night. And he said, wow. Said, okay, you know what, you are Bedou. This is Bedou you are playing, you are Bedou master. And the press guys were around then, no Instagram, no Facebook, but guess what? We have Gagia newspaper, Tribune, Concord. I don't know if Concord is still exist or not, but you know, we have newspapers and TV station there. So, and the press guys were like, the next day they were like, blow it out. And that was where all started, all it started from. And um, I respect for life for life because not just Nigeria, Africa, we actually don't respect him like that. We like him, we, uh, yeah, yeah, he's a prophet. But when you go outside, I'm talking anywhere, not just US or London, you go to Spain, the Spanish speaking countries, man, everywhere is Afrobeat now and they make reference to Fela and Nikola Kukuchi. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's the end of part one of our series, Sounds of Nollywood. Don't forget to join us next time when we explore the development of television and the growth of the music industry in Nigeria. Thanks for listening and thank you to all our guests. Stay safe. I'm Georges Collini.